Okay, so welcome to this uh, webinar, 12 and a half kick-ass sustainability ideas for 2020. And this is the taster for our Green Academy series of webinars. Uh, 2020 is a massive year. Two years ago, the, uh, the world's climate scientists told us that we had 12 years basically to turn the super tanker around and really start heading in a low carbon direction. At the minute, we're just slowing the trend. So the twenties are the decade of action and big action. No more little incremental fiddling around the edges. We need substantial uh, change to happen on the ground. So every year I pick these 12 and a half ideas from some of my favorites. I usually start off with some fairly incremental quick wins and work up to more complex stuff. But this year, because of the scale of the, um, of the challenge ahead of us, I have decided to go big uh, pretty much from the start. So first of all, though, I'm going to introduce myself one should do to be polite. So my name is Gareth Kane. I have somewhere about 20 years uh, experience in helping organizations cut the carbon footprint, cut their waste, um, act in a more environmentally friendly way. Uh, for, along the way, I started writing books. Uh, the one I'm holding in this picture, Three Secret Screen Business, was my, my first one in 2009, where I basically dumped everything I knew at the time uh, onto a piece of paper and tried to sell it as an ebook, but somebody picked, uh, publisher picked it up and said, we want to publish it. It is still by far my uh, best selling book. Although The Green Executive, my second book, is the one that I would recommend most. That came about because while I was waiting for The Three Secrets to be published, more and more of my clients were asking me to come in at a leadership board level and make strategic change. I couldn't find models and tools to do that, so I had to create my own. And I, because I was in the, the, the book writing frame of mind at the time, I, I wrote The Green Executive. And then I wrote three uh, titles for Do Sustainability, um, which has since been bought out by other organizations. So these are quite short books. One on green jiu-jitsu, green jiu if I can get that out, uh, which is um, we'll go into later, but it's all about employee engagement, building a sustainable supply chain, uh, which is self-explanatory, and accelerating sustainability using the 8020 rule. And you will see chunks of all of that, this, within the webinar. So... I currently, or for the last 13 or so years of those 20, uh, run my own consultancy, Terra Inferma Limited. We have three main areas of activity, sustainability strategy, employee engagement, and professional development. Uh, we have what I think is an impressive list of clients. Uh, there's uh, Fortune 500 clients, FTSE 100 clients, um, some big names there. Uh, including people like Interface, who, in my view, are probably the best sustainability in the world. And I like to think if we can help them, then we've got something to provide for everybody. So that's a bit of a sales pitch. You don't get a sales pitch in the main Green Academy, uh, which consists, apart from this taster, of 10 webinars, originally structured around uh, the Green, uh, Green Executive book, uh, but ever since each one of those sessions has been updated with practical experience. You will not get a recognized certificate for being on Green Academy because if this course was approved by anybody, by definition, you would be able to find that information somewhere else. Um, Green Academy is unique uh, because it basically tells you how we help other organizations get to grips with sustainability and not many people take the approaches we take, quite frankly, um, modesty aside and all the rest of it. So there are 10 webinars. Uh, this one, it tries to give you a taster across the board. So 12 and a half kick-ass sustainability ideas. There's probably more than 12, I have to say, or oh, there are more than 12. There's quite a lot of bonus ideas or sub ideas uh, where I take a, a big concept and then throw out a little sort of 
expert hint or tip of how I use these in practice. So there are plenty more. But first, the workbook. Which, uh, you, uh, we're provided a link for this. If you haven't printed it out, uh, don't worry, because it's quite the ex there's really one exercise in two halves in this one. From the vast majority of the sessions, we have a an exercise for each section of the um, of the webinar. So we will explain something to you, and then you will do an exercise to apply that thinking to your own organisation. And then there's a little exercise at the end. This one uh, you do as you can go along. I will not pause for you to fill in these gaps. If you've got printed out, well, good. If not, you can make these uh, headings at the top of a, um, of a sheet of scrap paper. For each of the ideas, there's a space to think of how you might apply that in your organization. And then I want you to think about the opportunity, high, medium, or low. And that's completely subjective. I will not tell you what is a high, uh, high level of opportunity and what's a low level of opportunity. That's up to you. And likewise, risk the downside. So if you just do uh, one letter in each box as we go along, then you'll get a feeling for at the end for which uh, ideas really appeal to you. Okay. So as I say, I won't stop for those, but onto the first idea, which is free your mind. I often say the biggest barrier to sustainability is just six inches wide, the space between your ears. It's 15 centimeters for those of us who use metric. And that applies not only when we're trying to engage with other people, which we will talk about later, but ourselves. So we tend to think, us in the sustainability profession, we have a tendency to think a certain way, which can be very limiting. Now, this is a theme that's going to run all the way through the session today, but I want to take one particular example, and that's about being upbeat. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Because you know, there's a huge amount of concern about climate change in particular out here, uh, out there at the minute. And we have people like Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg and, um, you know, greatest respect for them to standing up what they believe in. But I don't actually believe painting a picture of an apocalyptic future makes people act. You would like to think it would, but if you paint a, a picture of doom and gloom, people will do one of two things. First of all, like a certain Mr. Trump in Davos yesterday, you will say, you're prophets of doom, the facts don't play us up, you will deny it, you will play it down and you will do nothing because you don't want to confront the truth. Or the second, if you'd actually take it on board, is it produces eco-anxiety which is becoming a re real thing. I know some of my kids' friends at school are absolutely terrified of the future. And that doesn't help us change things because we have to be positive to change. We have to get people out of their comfort zone, yes, into their, what we call the stretch zone, where they make substantial changes. But beyond the stretch zone is the panic zone. And the panic zone, people shut down. So don't drag people into their panic zone. So I want you to think, in terms of your workbook, about areas where you could turn some of your messaging around and make it more upbeat, we can do something, rather than we are all doomed. Okay, idea number two, use the 80-20 rule, name of one of my books. And the book came out of a blog I wrote uh, because I felt that people were getting too bogged down in sustainability. It is a massive topic. You know, I, I sometimes feel I have to describe myself as an expert, but I don't think I am because I learn something new every day. So how do you cut through to what really matters? Well, the 80-20 rule is a, uh, it's a statistical phenomenon, and it says in many cases, 20% of inputs result in 80% of outputs. So if you go on the Terra Inferma YouTube channel, 80% of the total views of all the videos come from 20% of, uh, of the videos. So some are very, very popular and lots of them hardly get a look. And this unevenness 
is a phenomenon across life and you can use it to your uh, benefit and sustainability. For example, I once worked with a, advised a construction company, it wasn't a, a long project, and they, want, they wanted to know how they could engage their workforce across all their building sites. And that's thousands of people and it's a constantly shifting cast because uh, there's subcontractors and sub subcontractors come and go off each site depending on what job needs to be done. How do you engage all these people when it's so fleeting? My question to them was, what proportion of your footprint do these people represent? And they said 10%. 90% of our footprint, however you measure it, is in the design of our buildings. So I said, well, why don't you prioritize engaging the building designers rather than worrying about this uh, really complex job of trying to engage a huge number of people who are only responsible for 10%. So that's an extreme advanced uh, version of 80-20. This is 90-20, uh, uh, sorry, 90-10 or even, even um, a bigger extreme. But it's that kind of thinking. You know, what's, what can you do which will make most difference? And sometimes we get really bogged down in, um, and we'll come back to the problem with quick wins. But another example I give you is Aerial Excel Gel. Um, Procter & Gamble did a life cycle assessment of clothes washing, and they found that 80% of the energy use of, uh, in washing clothes across the board was from heating water in your washing machine to wash the clothes. So they designed a product which washed clothes at 15 degrees centigrade, which is not far above normal tap water temperature. Uh, and that, if your washing machine allows you to wash at 15 degrees centigrade, which is another question, but that allows you to slash the environmental impact of washing clothes, certainly the energy impact. I know there are other impacts as well. So, that's 80-20 thinking as well. You do the analysis, you look at you know, what are the really big things that we would need to change to make a difference, and you focus on them. And you let a lot of the little stuff go. You have to be a little bit careful with that because sometimes the little stuff is the things that your employees understand better or the public understands. So you do have to be careful that you're not uh, you know, willy-nilly using disposable plastic items when everybody's concerned about plastic for example. Okay, so number three, which is related, is incrementalism is the new greenwash. Because if you challenge any organization or often person on what they're doing to be more sustainable, you will typically get a huge long list of things they've done. The question is, does that big long list add up to anything? And often it doesn't. And they're fooling themselves because they think because they could list a couple of dozen things that they're making a difference, but it may not be. Their carbon footprint might be changing, their weight output might be changing. It's all uh, messing about around the edges. So we have to go from thinking about adding to that list of stuff we have done to what do we need to achieve and how are we going to achieve it. So thinking more like a high jumper. Set the bar, make sure you get over it. And a simple way of doing that is to think about how you're doing targets. A lot of people will set a target of cutting their carbon footprint by 2% year on year. So you'd expect it to follow the blue curve blue line. What happens is you start to run out of two percents and you end up with diminishing returns and you end up on the red curve. This is really important because you need to make fundamental changes and not just try and squeeze all the benefits you can out of the existing system. So what you do instead, you set stretch targets. You might say we will be zero carbon in 2050 and we will be 40% um, of our current carbon footprint in uh, 2030 or something like that. And these do two things. By setting a fixed distance target, a radical one, 
then it makes people mentally think more about the change required. But it also gives you that time to make the change. Because if you, like quite a few people on this session, have a huge amount of physical assets, to change those, you will need to do a lot of planning, often get permit, a regulatory permission, then you've got to construct, you've got to uh, commission and all the rest of those processes. So you actually need time to act. So you should set the stretch targets, depending on the type of organization, to allow for that, that type of stretch. Don't forget, if you've got any questions, stick them in the chat. So stretch targets, very, very important. And if you set a stretch target, don't let anybody say, then turn it into an annual target because that's dangerous as well. Because then you start looking for the 2% again. Right, number four, think circular. Now, the circular economy is a real buzzword at the minute. But unfortunately, a lot of people, and a lot of people who should know better, misunderstand it. Because a lot of people think the circular economy is about waste management. It is not about waste management. The circular economy is about sourcing sustainable raw materials. And you have to think of it that way around. Because if you think of it as a form of waste management, you will produce low grade materials and then you will run around looking for somebody to, um, to, you know, to try and take that material. What you should be doing is sourcing your raw materials from secondary sources, those are recovered, and you should be looking at who could use your waste materials and process them into something else. So it's all about the, the top of that circle, not recovery on the left-hand side. And I have, got, I have heard government, senior government official stand and say, we're trying to do the waste, uh, the circular economy, but we don't understand how it fits with the uh, waste hierarchy. And it's like, well, no, the waste hierarchy is about waste management. The circular economy is much bigger than that. It's about sourcing those raw materials. I mentioned Interface before. They have, they have worked out that the most sustainable source of raw materials for new carpet is old carpet. But I'll give you another example, because I could give you lots of Interface examples. Marks and Spencers, I bought my recycled uh, polyester umbrella of them years before I interviewed the head of Plan A, their main sustainability program at the time for the Green Executive. And he explained all the hoops they had to go through to source those materials. Because the vast majority of recycled polyester on the market was floating about looking for use, but nobody had thought of it as a raw material. So to get the uh, material they needed at at the volumes they needed it, they had to actually work with the, uh, with the supply chain, effectively the waste industry, to make that happen. So it's a different mindset. It's about raw materials, not about waste diversion. If you identify the raw materials, then the waste diversion will happen automatically, but it doesn't work the other way around. Right, I've got a question from Morag. Thank you, Morag. What are the most common objections raised to setting stretch targets? Um, to be honest, and I've done quite a few sustainability strategies recently, uh, if you assume that the organization needs to set a stretch target, they'll set it. I think it's quite often, remember what I said, uh, idea one about freeing your mind. I think sometimes us in the sustainability side are a little bit, uh, a, a, a little bit meek you know, unambitious because we're a bit afraid that the organization will laugh at us if we say, okay, we're going to go net zero or zero waste or any of these other uh, stretch targets. So uh, I can't think of a time when I've proposed a stretch target 
that somebody's gone, no, let's go for incremental. As I say, the, the slippage tends to be that, oh, we've got to, you know, if we are going to have our carbon footprint in 10 years, um, that's 5% per year. You have to watch for that one. Uh, but I, I, these days, I think it's becoming, the, the idea of a stretch target's becoming pretty common. So I can't think of anybody's actually stopped and argued against it. Feasibility, probably, I suspect. Okay, number five, make it work for the, your business. This one is uh, sometimes controversial. There was a, a few years ago, quite a few years now, some academic, I think, from Canada decided that corporate social responsibility only counted if it impacted on your profits. And I couldn't help, this was a typical academic in, in all um, senses of the word argument, because why are you going to, how are you going to get businesses to act more sustainably if it's against their nature? I argue the opposite, that in order to get a good sustainable sustainability project, you should align it with your business interests. So you find the sweet spot of success between what's good for your business and what's good for sustainability. And that might sound cynical, but it's actually very practical because it means that if there's uh, trouble in the business, uh, that your sustainability function doesn't get cut off in order to uh, try and make the business more profitable. If you're a part of the profiteering of the business, then it makes the, um, it makes sustainability sustainable. And what we talk about in the first session of Green Academy is actually exploring the business case in more detail. And this is my uh, model, one of the, which I developed for the Green Executive, which starts with compliance and works its way up to new market opportunities. And really, it's important to work out where you are within this uh, model because if your business case is winning new business, but your sustainability projects are expected to save money, then you will find a tension between the two. So you need to get this right. I don't have time to go into it all today, and the whole model, uh, because it's 25 past two already, but this is something we spend a whole hour on, is where do you fit in in that model? And then what do you do about it? Number six, I mentioned Green Jiu Jitsu, one of my books. And this is other people use Green Jiu Jitsu, but I have never known anybody else to codify it the way uh, the book does. And this came out of the realization that most of what we do is try and hector people into action. Going back to what I was saying at the start, we try and tell people, look at the the forest fires in Australia, aren't they terrible? What are we gonna do about it? And you're, you're like a boxer, you're trying to beat the other people into submission. So you see people saying, you know, has anybody got a really good sustainability poster? And things like that. And the problem with if you try and punch somebody is they'll try and block it and maybe try and punch you back. You know, it's a very aggressive confrontational point of view. Green Jiu Jitsu takes its name from the fact that a jiu-jitsu master will try and use their opponent's height, weight, strength, speed, momentum against them. So seeing those as opportunities rather than threats. What does that mean in practice? Well, another Venn diagram. This is the, the second and last Venn diagram, if you don't like Venn diagrams. But basically, it says, look at what your audience is interested in or good at. Look at sustainability and find that sweet spot again. And that's green jiu-jitsu. I first discovered this when I was offered uh, an opportunity. It was my first FTSE 100 company as a, a, in, in Terra Firma, And I was asked to go and talk to a bunch of engineers about sustainability and it was suggested the client suggested I come and talk to them about switching their TV off properly or sorting their recycling and I I panicked because I'm an engineer by trade and 
the idea of me walking in with these other engineers in a really high tech industry and telling them to switch off their TVs properly filled me with absolute dread, absolute dread. So I suggested that because they were engineers, we got them solving sustainability problems. So I actually mocked up some uh, fishbone diagrams, which is a simple engineering tool, and got them with post-its and pens and things, writing down technical ideas and solving them. And they loved it, and the client loved it, and the contract went on for many years. Uh, and I realized that's because instead of trying to change these engineers into tree huggers, I was persuading them that engineering and sustainability were perfectly compatible things. Likewise, I do a lot of work with the NHS. We always emphasize the health link, say, with climate change. But we also look at things like active travel to work and, and other, or um, for one of my NHS clients, uh, we have a target to have a biodiversity area at each one of their hospitals because um, it's been shown that green areas help patients uh, recover more quickly. So we're always trying to tap into that connection between sustainability health agenda. If I'm talking to a finance director, I make sure I've got some numbers with me. Or if one of my clients wants to talk to their FD, as was one of the case, showed me in presentation, said, what do you think? And I said, there's no numbers in it. If you're dealing with somebody who's used to looking at spreadsheets, give them a spreadsheet, give them some graphs, give them some data, some quantitative information, because that's what they're familiar with. And again, you will find that works really well. In fact, it can work extraordinarily well. Um, one of the sort of generic, even though green jiu-jitsu is always, always about uh, uh, customizing your engagement for your audience, one of the generic principles that works really well is involving people in creating the solutions. So uh, this was an early workshop I did when I was thinking, starting to uh, change my consultancy around. So I realized I used to have government contracts to do waste minimization. I'd walk in, I'd look around factories or sites, come up with a list of recommendations, demonstrate how much money they would save by doing these things, and then um, present a report. And if I ever bumped into the environmental manager I, was, I presented the report to a year or so later and said, how did you get on with them? They'd say, oh, uh, we've been very busy. I haven't had a chance to really consider it. We're going to do that next year. And there's always these excuses came out. Whereas when I started running workshops with my clients where they came up with the ideas with a little bit of guidance and nudging in the right direction, they got really enthusiastic about them and went and did them. So the vast majority of my consultancy work involves a series of workshops. And here's a, here's a tip. Here's, I'm giving away trade seek, big trade secret here, something very simple, but it works incredibly well. And that's how to sell sustainability to anybody. And the answer is don't try and sell sustainability to them, get them to sell sustainability to themselves. So if you've ever been in any of my workshops, I'm not sure looking down the list that any of you have, you will know, you would know that typically I will open them by walking up to the flip chart, taking a clean sheet of paper, I write, why are we here at the top? And then ask the audience, why should your organization take sustainability seriously? or a variation of that, depending on the exact context of the workshop. But that's my typical open gambit. I then shut up and wait. And somebody will say, save money. So I write up, save money. Anything else? Somebody will say, legislation. So I'll write up legislation. Anything else? Somebody will write uh, OPR. And we'll go down the list, and I'll get them to expand on some of the things and work out which one's the most important. But the really important thing about it is they have sold sustainability to themselves. And the reason why I open every workshop with that is once you've got over that hump, the suspicion goes and everybody rolls up their sleeves and gets stuck in. So there's a bonus top tip for you. I said I was going to do some bonuses. That one 
really is for for being so simple is incredibly powerful but it's all part of involving because obviously you need the people in the room and you have to ask them about it another psychological um phenomenon is how we actually change internally we are emotional animals we are not logic we are not logical we are not mr spock we act on emotion and we use our brains to justify it afterwards this picture is of a place called Monskorsk in arctic russia and it's here that 20 something years ago just over 20 years ago um i stood on this roadside and this should all be forest around me around behind me and everything there was nothing it was a dead zone the reason why it was a dead zone is that cloud coming out of those chimneys is a cloud of acid. The acid rain was falling and destroying the forests. So all around me, you can't really see in the picture, were bleached stumps of trees. It was eerie. You could taste the acid in the air. My Russian uh, host did not want me standing downwind of this factory for very long so I just took a picture or else I might have taken some more pictures to show you all the way around and got back in the car and we drove off. That was my road to Damascus. When I came back to the UK I decided that instead of being an armchair environmentalist this was not going to be my career this was going to be my life's work and it was because that level of emotion changes you. Now you can't ship all your colleagues off to Arctic Russia or to see where rainforest has been felled in Papua New Guinea and on all those sorts of things. But you can do, well, maybe you can if your organization is very, um, <laughs> very rich, but uh, you can do other things to, to leverage this fact that experience makes people change. One of the very nice examples that um, I came across is Nestle. Uh, wanted to encourage employees to take up electric cars to, uh, for, to commute to and from work. So they set up a financing scheme to get over the, the, you know, the fact that electric cars are still very expensive. But importantly, they hired a small fleet of electric vehicles and allowed people who were interested in taking one on to borrow one and use it for a few days. Because that experience of being, uh, of driving one and finding that actually this is all right, I can drive this, and it goes off like the clappers at the lights, gets over any fear of the unknown. So if, you, if you've got anything where you want to try and encourage people to do something positive, let them try it in a controlled environment. And it really brings down the barriers. Another workshop with another client I did. Um, the, some of the guys there were really keen on looking at waste because as part of the due diligence visit they had been sent to their um, waste contractors and saw the sheer volume of waste that, that company processed and that had a real emotional experiential effect on them as well. So don't expect people to act purely on logic, experience will, will unlock far more for you than that. Don't forget, if you've got any questions, I know you're probably scribbling down how you might do some of these things. This is a lot more quick fire, I have to say, than most Green Academy sessions. We take a little bit more time over it, but it's to try and maximize the value in the taster. Challenge your suppliers. Back to Interface again. Uh, as I said, Interface have decided that the most sustainable raw material for new carpet is old carpet. But they also look for uh, sort of flagship projects which do something above and beyond their reach and you can buy carpets from interface that are made from old fishing nets that have washed up on philippine beaches so they're taking plastic out of the ocean and turning it into carpet if for some reason you're ever at the PwC headquarters in London, you're walking on what they call networks carpet. So, and the, so it's fantastic, you know, that's a premium product, product. But how they get this stage is 
a bit like what I was talking about, green jiu-jitsu and everything else, they flip building a sustainable supply chain around. Most of us look to set a supplier code, to put out a questionnaire, and then to audit suppliers to make sure they're compliant. So you're policing your supply chain. You're trying to fix their problems. Interface do it another way around. They say, hey suppliers, how are you going to solve our problems? And they get a lot further with it. So it's a, it's a different mindset again on how to uh, get uh, sustainable suppliers. And you can do a thing called forward commitment procurement where you say, okay, in five years, we want X, material X to be all from secondary sources or we want a certain type of vehicle with hydrogen or electric, whatever else, if you have the buying power to do it, and let the suppliers know what you're looking for in the future so they start to invest in the change because they know they'll get uh, left out otherwise. So think about challenging your suppliers. What can they do for you rather than you trying to make sure that they're doing the right thing? Create the future you want, which sounds a bit new agey and suitably new agey picture on it. But again, we're about to cover one of the key messages from uh, Green Academy and the way I do sustainability strategy with my clients. So, say business as usual on this screen is the way, if you do nothing, that's where your business will go in terms of environmental performance. But you want to be down in this slightly arbitrary green box called sustainability. Don't get caught up in the details. These are all, this is all just a bit of conceptual. So what most people do is forecasting. They say, okay, if we do policy one, that will bend the trend downwards. And policy two, we'll do a little bit more. And they build it up until they think that they can get further down in towards that sustainability um, box. The problem is, is it's very hard to identify what massive changes that we were talking about before you're going to have to implement to make this happen if you look forwards. The other thing is you tend to get lost in the short-term noise, what we call the tyranny of the present, all these minor uncertainties. Let's face it, since, certainly since the banking crash in uh, 2008, maybe before, we have been living in a world of uncertainties. The uncertainties are there. They're never going to go away. So we're going to have to live with them. So instead of forecasting, I use backcasting. So in backcasting, you don't worry about today. You forget about today. You set your stretch targets that we talked about in number three, was it? And that will get you to sustainability. That gets you into the zone you want to be. And then you define that endpoint. And you work back to what you have to start doing today and what you have to stop doing today in order to get onto that trajectory. So you work backwards. I tend to do one intermediate step. You could do more. I find for practical reasons, one intermediate step. So say we are going to go net zero in 10 years. You, def you define what the organization would have to look like in 10 years to meet net zero. And then you go to five years time, so 2025, and say, what would we have to have started doing and stopped doing in 2025 to be able to do that in another five years? And then you go back to today and ask the same question. You might say I'm splitting hairs, but this makes a massive mental difference to how people uh, think about sustainability. Suddenly everything becomes feasible, it becomes doable. It gets rid of the tyranny of the present because you step into the future. So what, the last client I did this with are literally on the front line of Brexit. If we had had a no deal Brexit at the end of March last year, they would have been unable to get to some of their key sites because of motorway tailbacks in Kent on the approach to Dover. They knew that. 
So, and despite all this, I went into their senior management team, despite having all this worry and making sure that all the organization would function, I got them to do backcasting and they came up with a wonderful action plan for how they were going to meet their targets. So it gets rid of the tyranny of the present. Secondly, when I talked about involving people, it is perfect for group work. I mentioned senior management team. You do this with key decision makers in the organization. So not only do they know what's coming, but they've actually built this vision. They've built the action plan. They're far more likely to do it. So trust me, backcasting, it might seem just slightly different from the rest. I do it every time because it really works. And if you join Green Academy, we will do a mini backcasting exercise. Actually, we'll do a mini backcasting exercise a bit later on, but I must rush on. All right, number 11, unsustainability is poor design. Uh, this Lucasade Sport bottle is here because Lucasade Sport was um, flagged up a couple of years ago by the UK's Recycling Association as a terrible product for recycling. Why? Because they take a, a PET bottle, which is easily recyclable, and then they wrap it in an incompatible plastic film. And those two are very hard to get apart. I drink a lot of Lucozade Sport and I have to sit with a pair of scissors and cut off the film uh, before I put it in my recycling bin to make sure it does get recycled. Lucozade's response to this was, well, if anybody can come up with a technological solution to separating these two, we'd be great. To which point I nearly spat my dummy out and I probably should have stopped using Lucozade Sport because they've designed this badly. That's why you can't recycle it. There's a wonderful book called Ruined by Design by Mike, and his name just uh, left me a minute, Rurero or something. And it's a wonderful book. And he argues the world is not broken. The world is operating exactly as we have designed it. In other words, if something's gone wrong, it's because somebody's taken a design decision to do that. Look as it bottle sport is a very simple example. And if you take that attitude, then you can redesign systems to do what you want to do. So you, 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 it's by being proactive, you, you take control of the situation and say, actually, this whole process is designed badly. Let's stop, let's redesign it, let's start again. So we do a session on, uh, on eco design of products and services, which is massive, but obviously everything could be designed in a way, whether it's your supply chain, your business model or anything else. Mike Montero, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed. The, I hope you enjoyed the book as well. It's really good. But thank you for that. <laughs> Digging me out of a hole. I actually had a mental note to try and find the book on my bookshelf so that I could, uh, so I wouldn't stumble on it because when I hit the same problem, I ran through. Okay, so that's number eleven, which is basically uh, to put it a different way. Design is the basis or is the engine room of good environmental practice which was quoted from another book, which I cannot now find to uh, give that author due credit either. But thank you, Chris. So, McDonough and Braungart said, take the filters out of the pipes and put them where they belong, in the designer's heads. So let's solve these problems by design. The last one, last for 12 ideas, is, it depends a little bit, as we talked about, the base, uh, business case varies from organization to organization. Uh, but you should always think about your customers. Whose carbon footprint are you part of? And it's a very interesting thought process to actually work out. And again, it's like this one's like the flip side of the interface one where you're looking down the supply chain. This is looking up the supply chain and basically saying whose problem can we fix? So this is one of my favorite case studies. EAE is a small business. They have 40 to 50 employees, depending on the time of year. They deliver tourist leaflets around Edinburgh and around Scotland, wider Scotland, but they're based in Edinburgh, so they've got a big focus there. And Glenn Bennett, who's beside the wheel, is passionate about sustainability. So he's invested in this wind turbine, which he put in before there were any feed-in tariffs, so he didn't get a massive financial benefit from it. It provides free energy 
uh, to the depot. It charges up the electric van and his electric forklift at night, so they can use it during the day. But apart from that, he doesn't get benefit from it. But what he does find is that a lot of the Scottish quangos have very proactive procurement processes where they will give 30% or more of the credit when they score these uh, tenders to sustainability issues. And in one that he won, he was told the main difference between him and his competitors is they all put in a environmental policy. He put in a picture of his wind turbine. So think about what your customer wants. And in terms of, it, you know, I, th I really think this is an important part of the business case uh, and, and getting sustain doing sustainability properly. Because you keep, I keep finding again and again that people say, we'd like to do this because our customers are demanding it, but it doesn't meet our return on investment criteria set down um, in the company rules. And you go, well, if you don't keep your customers happy, you'll go bust. It doesn't matter how much you spend <laughs> in some ways. Uh, but that's a small business. We'll go to Johnson Matthey, another uh, client of mine, FTSE 100. They have a uh, third of the world's mark of the world market in catalytic converters. And it, but they did a recent restructuring. What I find interesting was the old division names used to be things like process chemistry. They now talk about clean air, efficient natural resources, and health. So they're looking to the customer and basically saying, what can we do for you? And um, obviously, the internal combustion engines' uh, years are probably numbered. So they, they're already thinking ahead of what their customers want and looking at more at bat how they can apply their technological know-how to battery technology and get better batteries for electric vehicles because they know at the end of the day, um, that clean air division is probably going to reduce because we won't have um, internal combustion engines to clean up. So number 12 is always think about your customers rather than internally. How is this going to look? What are they going to want? How are you going to be able to justify uh, what you believe are your achievements? How are you going to be able to prove them to your customer? And I think that's a really powerful, powerful way of looking at the looking at what you do and how you do it. Okay, there are the 12 ideas. I hope you've had an idea, to, this stimulated some ideas and you've got some things in that, um, in that list. What we're going to do now is, if I go back to the uh, workbook, you have an assessment grid. You've been marking high, medium and low against your ideas, hopefully. If you have numbered them, uh, one per number, you can put an A, B, part A, part B against them. If you write the numbers onto that grid, depending on how they scored on opportunity and risk, then the best ideas should gravitate to the top right. Just make sure you follow the high, medium, low on the, on the uh, horizontal scale there. So the highest impact, lowest cost ones should head up to the right. So this is slightly 80-20 thinking is what's the simplest thing you can do that'll have biggest impact. So I'm going to mute here a second, have a drink of water, and then we'll do the final exercise, which is very important. I'll give you a second to do that. And while everybody's finishing that off, again, if anybody's got any questions they want to ask, because we've got eight minutes left to go, we do have stuff to fill out eight minutes. Don't don't think we're quite finished yet, because we've got a very important step to do yet. Um, and then, but if you find the questions, then I can answer them. You know, I'm happy to stay a bit after three uh, if you're available as well. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation. 
Um, 12 and a half. You probably think that's 12. I promise 12 and a half. The reason why I make it a half is because this is a sales pitch and it's a sales pitch because it's a free webinar. So there has to be some quid pro quo. Um, the, the 12 and a half one is turbocharge your skill set. As I say, all of us can keep learning. I learn something new every day about sustainability and a big chunk of the work I do is helping other people improve their performance. The cheapest way of engaging me in this is uh, through Green Academy. And we'll, we'll give you a bit of an offer. Um, it's less interactive because we're doing it across the web. Uh, so it's less intimate. It's, but you know, it's the best way we have to getting a large amount of information out to a large number of people. More intimate is our corporate sustainability mastermind group, which meets every quarter in the northeast of England. It has it consists completely of um, senior sustainability people from large organisations, and we don't have any PowerPoint. We don't have any experts. I facilitate a discussion on a sustainability topic of their choice. So the next meeting's Friday week and we're talking about the supply chain. The second rule, the first rule is no experts, no PowerPoint. Second rule is Chatham House rule. So you're allowed to report what's said in the meeting but not who said it or who was in the room when it was said, which means that we can talk freely. So I was warning you here on the chat, don't put anything down that you don't want to say. Stuff gets said that you does not want to get out of that room uh, in the mastermind group. And the third rule is no buffet lunches. We always sit down and have a nice lunch afterwards. Uh, but it's a really effective uh, method of learning from each other. It's peer to peer. And it's, it's actually the favorite thing that I do. I learn a lot from it. And then the most intimate, version is one-to-one -one coaching where we can sit down and work through your problems step by step using a structured method and that again is very powerful and we can uncover stuff through that process that you are unlikely to uncover otherwise so if you'd like to sign up to green academy for 2020 if you sign up by next friday and i'll send out the link with the recording after the session uh we'll give you a quarter off the price and you know 10 hours of training for um, £26.40 an hour plus fat is very, very good value. You know, we don't get we don't get complaints about value for money, put it that way. You should really put the prices up. Uh, act quickly before I act on that. Right. Okay. I promise another exercise. If we go back to the workbook, I will show you how we complete every session of Green Academy, because I've been throwing a huge amount of stuff at you. So how do you filter that out? And how do you turn some of these very high profile concepts I've been talking about into practice? Well, this is how we do it. It's a bit like backcasting. I want you to list down in this page, what are the three most important things you think you've learned today? I've given you at least 12, a couple of sub ideas, so it's probably somewhere 16, 17, 18 ideas within that. But what are the three most important things you've learned from that conversation today? Second question for each one of those, what will you do differently as a result? So look forward a year, say, six months to a year, that kind of time frame. What would you like to be doing differently as a result of those three things that you've learned? And then finally, what three actions are you going to take this afternoon, tomorrow, Friday at the latest, to set the ball rolling on those three things? So we're breaking these high level concepts down to, you know, what are they? The three things that you'd like to take forward. 80, 20 thinking and all that. I don't expect you to take all 12 of them forward three things you'd like to take forward what will that look like if you implement those in six months to a year and then finally what three actions would you like would you have to 
do in the next couple of days to get the ball rolling. And, those, and I'm seriously talking about very small actions. It might be, I'm going to Google X. It might be, I'm going to ring Y and ask them about something. It might be, I, I need to book a meeting about Z. So very, very simple steps from the high concepts. So remember I talked about all those reports sitting on shelves. This is part of the problem if you don't bring it to what you're going to do next. So we do that exact same exercise at the end of every Green Academy session. I've wait only because I, I never ask you, as you probably noticed, what you've put on your workbook, because that's private to you. And you know, some confidentiality is important here. But when I have seen what people have put on this, it's always surprised me really how powerful this technique is. It's a little mini backcasting. Right, okay, that is the end of the taster session. I hope you've got at least three things out of it, maybe more. I hope it's got you thinking and fired up for, the, for this decade of change that I was talking about before. If you'd like more on this, by all means, come and join us for the, um, the year on Green Academy. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll go into a lot of these issues in a lot of detail and the exercises become more detailed, more penetrating, so that you can get more out of them to apply to your organization. So I will put that little um, advertising thing up. This is the only time I do uh, promote stuff uh, because you know it's a freebie and, uh, and all that. Um, but if any of you have any questions, we're at one minute to three, so I've brought it in within time. I always try and start on time, finish on time. Uh, far away if you've got any questions.